Welcome to the Friday meeting, y'all. Golden text at the chapel at JC's. Hope everybody's uh, well. Uh, right now, we're going to start with a serenity prayer with a moment of silence. God, uh, grant me the serenity, the serenity to accept the things, things I cannot change, change the courage to change the things I can, I can and the wisdom to know the difference. difference. Amen. All right. Alcoholics Anonymous is a fellowship of men and women who share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem and help others to recover from alcoholism. The only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. There are no dues or fees for AA membership. We are self-supporting through our own contributions. AA is not allied with any sect denomination, politics, or organization, or institute, does not wish to engage in any controversy, neither endorses nor opposes any causes. Our primary purpose is to stay sober and help others, other alcoholics, to achieve sobriety. Um, we're going we're gonna to have Fred. Fred, tell us more about alcoholism. Which one first? Uh, more about alcoholism. Yeah, then come on up. Hi, everybody. My name is uh, Fred. I'm a grateful, recovered alcohol drug. Hi, Fred. Hi. Most of us have been unwilling to admit we were alcoholics. No person likes to think he's bodily and mentally different from his fellows. Therefore, it is not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove that we could drink like other people. The idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinking, drinker. Excuse me. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. The delusion that we, the delusion that we are like other people or presently, like other people or presently maybe has to be smashed. We alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. We know that no real alcoholic ever recovers control. All of us felt at times that we were gaining control, but such intervals, usually brief, were inevitably followed by still less control, which led into pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. We are conceived to a man that alcoholics of our type are in the grip of a progressive illness. Over any considered period, we get worse, never better. With or without drinking, we are like men who have lost their legs. They never grow new ones. Neither does there appear to be any kind of treatment which will make alcoholics of our kind like other men. We have tried every imaginable remedy. In some instances, there were there has been brief recovery, followed always by a still worse relapse. The physicians who are familiar with alcoholism agree there is no such thing as making a normal drinker out of an alcoholic. Science may one day accomplish this. But it hasn't done so yet. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, thank you. Now I'm going to have. Jasmine, tell me how it works. Hi, I'm Jasmine. I'm an alcoholic. Hi, I'm Jasmine. Jasmine. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to the simple program. Usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. They are such unfortunate. They are not at fault. They seem to have been born that way. They are naturally incapable of grasping and developing a manner of living which demands rigorous honesty. 
their chances are less than average. There are those, too, who suffer from grave emotional and mental disorders, but many of them do recover if you have the capacity, capacity to be honest. Our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like, what happened, and what we are like now. If you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you are ready to take these certain steps. As some of these we thought, we thought we could find an easier, softer way, but we could not. With all the earnestness at our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us have, have tried to hold on to our old ideas, and the result was no until we let go absolutely. Remember that we deal with alcohol, cunning, baffling, powerful. Without help, it is too much for us. But there is one who has all power, that one is God, may you find him now. Past measures availed us nothing. We stood at the turning point. We asked his protection and care with complete abandon. Here are the steps we took which are suggested as a program of recovery. One, we admitted we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Two, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Three, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Four, made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Five, admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Seven, humbly asked him to remove our shortcomings. Eight, made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Number nine, made direct amends to such people where possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. 10, continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. 11, sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood him, praying only for knowledge of his will and for us and the power to carry that out. 12, having had a spiritual awakening of the results of these steps, we tried to carry the message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all our affairs. Many of us, many of us explained, what in order, I can't go through with it. Do not be discouraged. No one among us has, has been able to maintain anything like perfect adherence to these principles. We are not saints. The point is that we are willing to grow along spiritual lines. The principles we have set down are guides to progress. We claim spiritual progress rather than spiritual perfection. Our description of the alcoholic, the chapter to the agnostic, and our personal adventures before and after make clear three pertinent ideas. A, that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. B, that probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism, and C, that God, God could and would, would if he were, were sought. sought. Thank you, Jasmine. I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Anthony Way, and I'm an addict. Um, Anthony. Anybody um, new to this meeting or just coming back? Uh, Garris, great for recovery alcohol. Garris. Welcome. Garris, showing up, baby. All right, um, we're gonna get this meeting started. Um, I would like to introduce the special speaker. Um, she's an inspiration everywhere she goes. From my, my knowledge, I only can speak for myself. Um, reason why I say that is that um, it's, it's what she does and how she lives. A lot, of, a lot of people just doing AA just to do it. She does it to help people. And um, couldn't be more honored just to have her speak. So, without being anything being said, Katie, come and hit the mic. Katie, <laughs> hey.
um, a little bit about where I came from, what it was like, right? So I am a Floridian, born and raised, basically like a unicorn now. Um, there aren't many of us anymore. So <laughs> um, I grew up in Coral Springs, which is west of here. And I grew up in a home with an alcoholic mother and I was exposed to this disease very young. And I saw what it does to people, but it didn't turn me away from it, which is not everyone's story. For me, it kind of, it offered a solution for me very early on. And so I, you know, grew up in a house where it was very much like upper middle class. You don't talk about what's going on inside the home. Um, from outside appearances, everything looked great, but there was no food in the fridge and my mom was drunk on the couch all day long and there was abuse and all this stuff, but like you had to make it look good on the outside so no one knew what was going on. So I learned very young that as long as stuff looked good out here, it didn't matter what was going on inside. And that kept me sick for a long, long, long time. So, um, you know, growing up in a home, if anybody knows what that's like, there's another fellowship that talks about that a lot. Um, but growing up in a home with an alcoholic, it's described as, living in a place where there's a bomb in the attic and a bomb in the basement and you never know when it's gonna go off, right? <laughs> so it's like this feeling of anxiety and impending doom. And I carried that with me for a long time. It didn't really go away after I left the house. So my sister is nine years older than me and my uh, father had a great job but he traveled a lot. So it was just mostly me and my sister and my mom in the home. And I watched my mom and my sister, who were like best friends, party together all the time. So as far back as I can remember, I, there was parties in the house, like people drunk in wheelbarrows, like getting rolled around my house, and like people doing shrooms in my playroom, and like, it was just like, it was, it, that was my normal. I didn't understand that that wasn't normal. Like, I just thought that's what everybody did behind closed doors, right? until you know, I had my best friend in the neighborhood and I started hanging out with her family and they were normal. They weren't really normal, but it would be what we call in the rooms normal. Um, <laughs> and they like ate dinner around a table. The mom made dinner. There was like food in the fridge and stuff. And I was like, <laughs> they didn't just eat McDonald's every night. And I was like, wow, like this is kind of cool, right? And her mom like took her to school in the morning and it was crazy. I love you. And um, <laughs> so I started to realize maybe this isn't normal, right? And then the shame started to creep in. So this is probably like around eight years old. And I started to feel really shameful about who I am, right? Uh, those feelings of not feeling like I belong anywhere, not feeling like I deserve to be loved because I didn't get it in my house. So I didn't really understand like how it was affecting me at the time, but I brought that with me everywhere. I didn't feel like I belonged at school. I didn't feel like I was worthy of being accepted at school and dance and all this stuff. And so I learned that if I could just be a good girl, right, that I could then maybe be accepted and loved. So like I did really well and performed really well in school and in dance until I hit about 10 or 11 years old. And then an eating disorder crept in and I started to develop, I hit puberty pretty young, as you can tell, I'm like a tall girl. So this happened like, at like 11, like I was just here. Like this is how <laughs> from like 11 to 12. So like, it just was like, pew, and then I was this size. And um, so, <laughs> wow. and I wore makeup and I danced and da 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 da. And so I was in the older classes with the older girls, um, because like I said, I knew how to perfect the outside, right? And so I started to find myself acting in ways that put me in situations where I was exposed to drugs and alcohol, right? So I had my first drink really when I was like eight or nine, I had a shot of Goldschlager. And for if anybody in here knows what the hell that is, it's not a fun drink, but it looks really pretty in the bottle, right? It looks really pretty in the bottle. And for an eight or nine year old, you're like, that looks like a candy, I want some. And then you taste it and you die. And you're like, but I remember at nine years old, I just wanted to be a part of, right? 
I wanted to be accepted and loved by my mom and my sister. And that's what they were doing. And so if they would let me join the club, then I could be a part of. Maybe they would love me. Then maybe I would feel accepted in my own home. Maybe I wouldn't feel like such an outsider. Maybe I wouldn't have that, that gut-wrenching feeling of there's something wrong with me, right? And so I associated that first shot, even though I didn't get drunk, I associated it as a solution. I thought, oh my God, now I'm part of the club. Now I get to be accepted and loved. And anything I do after this, I can blame on the shot because that's what I see everybody else doing, right? So even if I act stupid and that anxiety and that self-consciousness comes up, then it doesn't matter because I can just blame it on the alcohol. And everybody will laugh and think it's hilarious because I'm drunk. And so that was my first experience with tasting alcohol. At 11, I decided to lie about my age and go hang out with older boys. And <laughs> that didn't go so well for me. And I had my first drunk at 11. Um, I drank about half a bottle of like the, the pop-off liter. And I didn't understand what was gonna happen to me because I saw my mom drink those liters all the time. We had a whole cabinet full of them, right? And I drank half of that and I got, I passed out, I got violently ill and I had some severe consequences that evening. I had some very severe consequences that stuck with me for a long time until I did therapy when I got older. And, um, but I'll tell you what, I couldn't tell anybody what happened. And the girl who was with me saw what happened, but she couldn't tell anybody and she was only a couple years older than me and she didn't know what the hell to do but I was mad and I was resentful that she didn't do anything. And I never thought, hey, I shouldn't drink again. I thought, hey, I can't put myself in that situation again. This is my fault. I did this, so I just have to figure out how to do it differently next time, right? Because I had already made the, the idea that alcohol was a drug. And I will tell you this right now, there are a lot of schools of thought on this, alcohol, um, and drug addiction is a genetic, it's, it's genetic, it runs in families. My, it, it's deep in my bloodline, Irish and Italian, you know, like it's in there. <laughs> and my mother was one, and it, it, if you go back in the lineage, you can see it. Um, and I truly believe that I was born an alcoholic because the first time I drank, I drank alcoholically. If you look in our big book and we agnostics in the first chapter, it gives us two qualifiers after they explain to us what an alcoholic is. And it says, if you cannot stop, once you try to stop, stay stopped. And if you have little control over the amount that you take once you start, then you are probably alcoholic. That was my first experience with alcohol and every experience with any substance thereafter. So I know for a fact without a doubt today that I am an alcoholic. I could not admit that to you then. <laughs> I'm very hard headed and had to be beat over the head quite a few times and have plenty of experience to pull from. But that first experience that I just shared with you at 11 years old answers that both of those questions is yes. And so I continued on that journey after that experience because it gave me yet another good reason to drink. It gave me yet another good reason to need to escape. And so I started to experiment with different substances and my progression of this disease, because I have a disease that is chronic, fatal, and progressive, it will kill me, it gets worse over time, and if I don't treat it, what did I say? I'll have it forever. I'll have it forever. It gets worse over time. It'll kill me if I don't do something about it, right? So it got worse. I, I, I experimented with different substances. And by the time I was 14 or 15, I had left my home and um, dropped out of school, dropped out of dance, and started to, um, I'm going to talk about drugs because that's just part of my story. Um, and that's just what it is. So... I started to use um, Xanax and my life got real crazy and I was 15 years old and again all I ever wanted was to be loved and accepted and feel like I was worthy of those two things and I found people that made me feel that way although it was false and a distorted sense of love and belonging I felt a part of and that was all I ever wanted, was just to feel like I was good enough to be accepted by somebody else, to 
because I didn't know how to love myself. No one ever showed me how to do that. So if I felt it somewhere, even if it was distorted and it wasn't the right way that you're supposed to be loved, I just wanted to, to feel that. And so I got with a bunch of these, um, I got with a boyfriend, right? Because that's always part of the story. I got her a girlfriend and I got with somebody and I moved in with him and I started hanging out with all his, his friends that were girls and they all did drugs. And so they all like were the one, okay, I'll tell you how I qualified if someone was good for me or not. The one girl had got stabbed on the beach during homecoming and I thought that she was awesome and I wanted to hang out with her every single day. Okay, that's how I qualified if someone was cool or not, right? So like, I was like, yeah, she's hard, whatever. And so I thought I was like the biggest badass. So I hung out with this whole crew and like, we would rob cars and we would fight and we would just get trashed on Xanax and do stupid stuff, right? And I thought that was like the coolest thing ever. I literally thought that was the coolest thing ever. And that went on from the time I was 15 to the time I was 18. I really can't tell you what happened a lot during that time because it was like just one big blackout. But I can tell you what happened when I was 18. And I was sitting on the floor one morning in an efficiency on the beach. And I had woken up, it's probably like three o'clock in the afternoon or something. And I had woken up and I thought I still had a leftover from the night before. And I started, and I started digging through every single purse and every single pocket and his pockets and his wallet and under the bed and here and there and there. And there was nothing. And we all know that obviously I did that all the night before and I was just kidding myself. But I found there was this moment of me sitting in the middle of the floor in this dirty efficiency on the beach, bawling like a child because I was exhausted and I couldn't imagine working up the hustle to break in cars that day or dope fiending somebody to give me money or front me or whatever. And I was sitting there crying because I couldn't believe that this is what my life had become. It was like this moment of this outside looking in going, who is this person? You were a ballerina straight A student and now you're sitting on the floor crying in a dirty motel room over drugs. And I couldn't understand how I got there. And I called my family, who I hadn't lived with and had been robbing blind um, for the past several years. And this was this was circa, I don't know, like 2000 and something, early 2000s. So you got off of your parents' insurance when you were 18. Um, and I was 18, right? So my dad was like, listen, we'll get you help. I'll extend the insurance for an additional six months and we'll get you in somewhere. And I went to a place called University Pavilion in Tamarack. Um, and it was an inpatient facility, 28 days, right? Well, here's the thing. I do really well at structure. If you tell me what to do, I want to be that good girl, right? So I will do it because I feel like if I do it, then you'll like me and I'll be worthy of love and your love and belonging. And so I went in there, and it's funny because I was just telling this story to somebody the other day. I went in there, and I'm this 18-year-old girl, and there was like four other people in there. One was this old lady who never came out of her room, and the other three were men. Two of the men being one who was addicted to Xanax and like 45 about to lose his home and his family. The other one being a boat captain who, for a shark fishing boat who was a heroin addict, an IV heroin addict. And at this point, I was just swallowing pills just swallowing pills right and so I went in there and I compared out and I first of all I made friends with the two worst people in there right because that's who I go towards that's how my picker was broken and I was like you guys are my new best friends let's hang out and smoke cigarettes all day long and they told me all their stories about how trash they would get and this guy and how he would have this shark fishing boat and he would go down and he would shoot dope in his neck and he'd come up and be like bleeding and helping the people pull sharks out of the water and I'm like I'll never be like that right I won't ever be that dude like I just have a problem with smoking weed and taking pills and I'm 18 right and so they tell me to do things when I'm in there like don't hang out with those guys. <laughs> and also to leave the boyfriend who's still using and to go to meetings when I get out and get a sponsor and do all these things that we hear all the time, the suggestions that I know today keep me sober, the things that have created miracles in my life to the point where I no longer have the obsession to use like I did back then. But I didn't want to hear that stuff because <laughs> I wasn't ready yet. And I left that program 
and I was driven to a, a meeting that night at the same hospital and I walked in the meeting and my selfishness and self-centeredness made me believe that everyone was looking at me, right? So I have that anxiety, right? I still have that anxiety. Social anxiety was severe for me. I would have panic attacks when I was going to groups of people. And then I walk in and I think everyone's looking at me and I'm the topic of conversation when I walk in that room. No one probably even noticed me, right? And the whole time I sat there, I didn't hear anything the speaker said because I was so in my head. I was trapped in that prison of the, the insecurity and fear. And then at the end, some dude came up and tried to hug me. And I was like, I knew it, right? Like this is, this is some weird place where the girls get picked up and they brainwash you and it's a cult and all that stupid crap that I told myself. And this is called contempt prior to investigation. This is what they share about in the big book when you look in appendix two after they share about the spiritual experience and they say the only thing that will keep us in everlasting stupidity is a concept called contempt prior to investigation, which means what? It means choose deciding that something isn't going to work and that it's garbage before I ever actually try it. And that's what I did that night. And I said, no, 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 these programs are not for me. And for the next six years, my disease progressed into something that felt like a demon had taken over me. I went from that person who just took pills and smoked weed to a severe IV opiate addict in, in Broward County and in 2010, that was unheard of. That wasn't a thing down here. You just smoked pills or swallowed them. I was an IV drug user and people looked at me like I was a pariah. And I was addicted to crack cocaine and I lived on the streets right outside this building for three years, in and out of the hotels. On the way here, I'm driving and I was listening to worship music and I'm driving and I'm so excited to come here and speak and share the miracle that God has given me today, this sobriety with you guys, because I haven't got to speak at a meeting in a while. And I passed by a dumpster behind the 7-Eleven on Federal, the street right by it, where someone beat me within inches of my life. And I smiled because I am so fucking grateful that I don't ever have to go back to living that way again. Because you know what went through my head that night when that person almost killed me behind that 7-Eleven? It's God, I hope they don't find the pills that are hidden in my undergarments. <laughs> That's what I was thinking about. <laughs> As I hope they don't find my drugs. Because I didn't care about my life anymore. The drugs robbed me of the way that I could care about my life. They robbed me of the ability to make choices that were actually in my own favor. And that, I would like to say that that was when I got sober at that point. But no, it took about six months after that. And at 24... After going to jail 13 times and being in and out of psych units, I got to a point of submission. I wouldn't say I was at surrender yet, but I got to a point of submission. Um, I, I had been, I would get picked up. I would always get arrested for nothing. Like I would have nothing on me. I would get arrested for paraphernalia and catch felony charges, right? Like, that was how it always went for me. I'd always be like, just on my way about to get something and then the cops would get me. So I'd always end up in jail, dope sick, on a paraphernalia felony charge. And I'm like, how does this happen to me every time? And so I, <laughs> I have to share this one story and then I'm gonna get into the solution. What time is it? Okay. So I got arrested when I was, at one point, like when I was like 22 or something. And at this point I was already addicted to, to opiates and and I, um, I went in and I was waiting for my court date, which usually takes about 30 to 45 days in Broward County. I don't know what it is now, but that's what it was back then. And um, I was waiting for my court date. I got arrested the day before Thanksgiving. So I went in right over the holidays. It was like right after my birthday, because my birthday's November 14th, and then Thanksgiving and all the holidays that come after. And um, I remember eating the Thanksgiving dinner in the infirmary, dope sick, and that was, I didn't eat, I just looked at it. Um, and thinking, okay, I gotta get out of here, right? Like, how do I get out of here? And um, the court date came. 
after like three weeks, right? So I've already gone through the worst of my withdrawals and I'm um, just starting to be, I'm just coming out of the woods. Like I'm just starting to be able to eat again and like not like die at night. And um, I go to court and I have this very great public defender who was with me the whole time. His name was Dale Miller and I, I hope to find him one day and thank him for everything that he did for me. Um, and he, he sat me down and he goes, Katie, you're not gonna like this. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> you don't wanna hear that, right? And he's like, your father did something. And I'm like, what do you mean my father did something? He's like, your father wrote a letter to the judge. I'm like, what does it say? And it's asking him to keep you in there because your parents know that you're alive here. I was so mad and I love him so much today for that because like that saved my life it was one of the pieces of the puzzle that saved my life and I went up in front of the judge and he's like you're not getting out and um I stayed in there until February 24th so I got 90 days and um I remember talking to my dad on the phone for Christmas and like my dad was the one who was always in the corner for me right he still is to this day and he's not a crier he's like and um, we were on the phone on Christmas, and he was sitting on the little stool on the pink phone. And he's like, he just started bawling in the middle of the sentence. He's like, I can't believe you're talking to my little girl in jail on Christmas. And um, you know, that hurt, that hurt real bad. But un uh, unfortunately, froth the emotional appeal isn't enough to keep me sober. It doesn't matter how many freaking people beg me to stay sober because I have this disease. And until I can practice abstinence and have a spiritual experience, I don't get to stay sober for the long run. I don't get to experience the miracles and the, the promises that come from this program. And so I got out on February 24th with all intentions to stay sober. And on March, on an ankle monitor, right? On an ankle monitor, because I was gonna do it this time. And I was back in front of the judge on March 24th, exactly 30 days later, and court ordered to six months in jail because I said, screw the probation, I can't do this because I got high the day I got out of jail. And that's how this disease works. It didn't matter how bad my family wanted me to get it. It didn't matter how bad I wanted to get it because I didn't work a solution when I got out. And so fast forward, a few more jails. Um, at 24, I was on probation again and looking at a prison sentence of 18 months because I couldn't stay sober and I kept violating my probation. And I felt the walls closing in around me and I was living in a, in a, a con, I was, wasn't living there. I, I had to take someone hostage. <laughs> <laughs> I was staying at, a, at a, a nice apartment down the street, a little condo, and um, the police were knocking on the door and I was bear crawling to the bathroom to do the rest of my drugs before they came in. And I knew that the walls were closing in around me and I couldn't get high anymore. My solution wasn't a solution anymore. It was causing more problems than it was solving. I couldn't even, I couldn't even get the relief that comes at first from that first, the first drink or, or, or high. It wasn't even coming anymore. I didn't get relief. I just felt like shit all the time. And so I decided that it was time for me to admit myself to a psych unit because I wasn't going to detox in an ISO cell in jail again. I couldn't do that again. <laughs> so I thought. And um, I went to the psych unit and I told him I was going to kill myself and I was sitting there in the waiting room, like the admissions department. Um, and I'm just like, you know that point where you're just like so tired and exhausted, you're just like get me upstairs and give me food in a bed. I just want to sleep forever, right? And they come in and they're like, we're sorry, we can't take you. And I'm like, no, you have to take me. I told you I was gonna kill myself. So, <laughs> you know, I think I'm so, I think I'm so smart. And um, they're like, no, we can't take you because you're pregnant. And I'm like, what? Oh, like, the, like the whole world like just got silent. And I was like, what are you talking about? And here's the, here's the, here's the messed up part, but the miracle in it is that two weeks prior, I remember walking right there next to Miami subs praying, God, please, maybe if you get me pregnant, I'll be able to stop. Wow. God, maybe if I have a baby, I can stop because that's the only get left. And somebody had put that in my head at some point, and so I believed it, right? 
and now they're telling me I'm pregnant. So I would like to tell you that I got sober at that point and I went home and I was like, this is it, I'm gonna change my life. But I continued to use and um, I ended up finding a detox program that took pregnant women and I went there, I did great in the structured program, but I decided that I need to get out a couple days early because I got some shit to handle before I turned myself in, right? I got some, I got some things I gotta take care of, I'm taking my will back. And so I dope feed my discharge date to a couple days earlier and I went home and I ended up using. And I went to jail, I turned myself in two days later when I said I was going to, but I had set off something called the obsession and the phenomenon of craving. So when I went into that jail, it didn't matter that I wasn't physically addicted. I had set off the phenomenon of craving. I went in there like this, like restless, like about to jump out of my skin. And all I could think about was that obsession that I need to get high one more time, just one more time, and then that'll be it. It'll be different this time the great lie, the great deceiver of this disease and what it tells us. And I sat, in that, I sat in that infirmary and it was the worst experience I've ever had. I don't know if any of you have ever been to jail pregnant, but you're in a room the size of this with like 14 other women and you all just stare at each other all day and none of them were addicts and I had track marks all over my arms and they made fun of me and they talked shit and it was the worst experience I've ever had in jail because normally I had fun in there. But like, <laughs> I know, it's terrible. And um, so this was like was exactly what I needed. I needed that pain and that suffering. God was like, you know what? This is what you need right now. You need to experience this pain and suffering sober, at least somewhat sober, abstinent, so you can remember why you don't, what, what life could be like outside of here. And um, I left that place, and I, I uh, they were supposed to do a custody to custody. I threw myself at the mercy of the judge, and I said, please don't send me to prison, I'm pregnant. And they court ordered me to 10 months in treatment at Susan B. Anthony. And um, they didn't do a custody to custody. And there's something in our literature called a sober blackout. And I don't know if any of you have read about this, but it says there will come a time where we won't really know what happened and we'll end up drunk or high again. And we'll be, they say, banging on the bar wondering how we got in this place again. And that's exactly what happened to me. And I would never believe it unless it happened to me, but I got out of that jail and I literally cannot remember what happened. But I was high again walking down these streets. And I came to like three days later and I'm like, I'm going to prison. I was supposed to show up at Susan B. Anthony, right? By God's grace, only by God's grace, because I peed dirty for several times at my probation. I tried to go there, they wouldn't take me in because I had to go back to detox. By God's grace, I tell you this, my drug dealer called my baby's father on me to come pick me up and take me to the detox unit so that I could detox and get my ass into Susan B. Anthony. And the day I got to Susan B. Anthony, I remember walking Well, here's actually, I went to the detox on April 20th, 2011. And I, you have to go in through the emergency room so they can clear you. And I went in through the emergency room and they're like, no, you're not going into the detox unit because you need to go to an observation because you're about to die and we're worried for the baby, right? And so here I am about to OD, laying there for the first time hearing my baby's heartbeat at four months uh, pregnant. And they put me in that unit and I woke up April 21st, 2011. And I remember looking around this hospital room going, did I get here again? How is this my life? And there was a moment, there was a moment where I thought, this is it, I can't do this anymore. I surrender, God. I don't want to keep doing this. I can't live like this any longer. And God puts people in our life. Because God had my daughter's father sit in that room with me. He, had a, he would do shit like that before, but he sat with me in that room for 24 hours until they cleared me to go into that detox unit. And I'll tell you what, obsession in me, this disease is so strong in me that the whole time I laid there, even though I didn't want to use, I was about to use against my will because there was a phone next to that bed and I thought about calling my dealer several times. And if he hadn't been sitting there watching me and I knew I couldn't let him down, because any other time I'd be like, fuck him, I don't care. But I knew I couldn't do it this time. And I went into that detox unit and it was a blur for like five days, but I ended up at Susan B. And I walked in there and something shifted in me because I started to think to myself, maybe I can stay sober through this program. I didn't think I was gonna stay sober forever. That was not what my thought process was. I thought maybe I can ride this out. Maybe I don't have to use while I'm here. I'll do the 10 months, I'll get off probation and then we'll see what happens, right? And so I go in there and I had, I had a spiritual experience within that first 36 hours. Where am I at? 
I had a spiritual experience within that first 36 hours because I walked in and you meet you meet people, right? Like you meet like the lady and they go through your bags and they search you and they do the whole thing and blah, blah, blah. And they start telling me about my roommate. And my roommate is this girl who has six months sober, right? They're telling me she has six months sober. She was there on a trafficking charge. She was supposed to get 15 years, mitigated, da, da, da. Some of you have heard this story before. And I'm like, holy shit, this girl has six months sober. That's crazy. Because I want to be like her, right? She's got a job. She's got her kid back. Like, I'm like already idolizing this girl because I can't put six seconds together without thinking about getting high. And she's got six months. And I'm like, cool. Like, ah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to latch on her. Like, I'm going I'm to make her my friend. She's my roommate. She's like peer mentor, leader of the crew, the whole thing, right? And I then hear about this girl so I'm, I'm like making it up in my head and then we go to a meeting that night so we all hop on the druggy buggy some people with their kids and stuff it's all women and their children and we go to a church in hollandale and as you know this was my stomping grounds so it's like the same neighborhood i was just getting high in like a week earlier and we walk into this old beat down church right and I'm like, I'm, I'm that, that anxiety, that anxiety's in me. And I'm like, oh, and I walk in the room and I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna sit in this chair right back here in this corner where no one can see me. And I start to see everybody talking to this, this little short old lady. She's like, she's one of those people, you know, she's been smoking cigarettes her whole life. Like she's got like that raspy voice. Like she's got like, she's a Florida lady, so her skin's like real tan and tough, you know? And I'm like, what is this chick gonna say that's gonna resonate with me? She's like a hundred, right? And I know I was ignorant and young, guys. This is what I was thinking that. I wouldn't think that now, maybe. I don't know. Um, and so I'm sitting there, and I, again, here I go with the comparing out. And she walks up to the little podium, and she picks up the thing, and she starts to tell her story. She's like, when I was walking the streets down here when I was 20, and I'm like, mm -hmm. and she proceeds to tell my story. And I cried in that church. I cried in the back of that room and I bawled and I don't know where it came from because normally I would have never let myself do that in front of people because I prided myself. I had I had false pride on how what a badass I was. When really inside I was just a scared little girl who was so freaking fearful of her feelings that she would go do anything to just numb out every single day of her life before she felt a single thing. But I pride I had false pride because I was badass because I would do anything. And I cried in that room. And I felt like I wasn't alone in that moment. And I felt like maybe somebody got me and I felt like maybe there was hope for my life. And I started to have a little bit of faith. And I got back on the, the, the van and we went back home and we go up in the room and I'm, I don't have a phone, I don't have a TV, I don't have shit, right? And I got court the next, I got court the next day and I'm for sure, like, they're sending me to prison, right? Like, I already knew. Like, that's that's it. I violated. I shouldn't even be here, right? I shouldn't even be here right now. And so I, like, 11 o'clock rolls around. I can't sleep. I'm restless, the whole thing. And she doesn't show up. No roommate. And I'm sure all of you know exactly right now the same thought that I have when that happened. She got high. She's getting high. Why is she not here? This girl who had six months sober, 15 years hanging over her head, this one who I had idolized, and everyone had so much great things to say, what a superb person she was in the community, had left her kids at the daycare and went and got high, and it didn't matter what consequences were hanging over her head because her disease was untreated, and she went and got high that day. And I sat in there, and 12 o'clock rolled around, and 1 o'clock rolled around, and I'm freaking out because I got to go to court the next day, and I know this girl is out there getting high, and I'm like, shit. And I had my first moment of honesty. My first little piece of step one happened, and I go, that's going to be me if I don't do something. I'm going to be the one who leaves their kid at daycare. Why not? I did everything else I said I want to do, and I had that moment of true honesty with myself that if I don't do something, that's going to be me. And I woke, I didn't wake up, I stayed up all night and I went to court the next day and here's my next God moment in this first 36 hours of entering treatment. And I go into court right in front of the same judge that's seen me with my same public defender, the same people that have seen me rolling in and out of this courtroom, rolling in and out of this courtroom. Knew I was supposed to be in Susan B months earlier but screwed up, right? And I walk in and I got my little, my little uh, escort with me from Susan B Anthony. 
and we're sitting there and they call my name and I'm like, oh, here we go, right? I'm going to prison, like I'm ready, right? I'm like contemplating running out of the courtroom. And I go up and the judge opens up the thing and he goes, all right, Catherine Townsend, Susan B. Anthony, okay, next. And I'm like, <laughs> I turn around and I walk into town and I'm thinking this can't be real, right? He's gonna call my name as I'm walking back to the seat. And then we're still sitting in the courtroom as the other cases are going and I'm looking at the lady from like, get your keys. Get your keys. We gotta go. Like, for real. And that by God's grace, guys, by God's grace, there is no reason that I should be standing here right now. There is no reason that I should have my child in my custody. I should have gone to prison. My baby would have been born in the system. It wasn't because I did something right to make that happen. It was because God had grace. And I went in there and I said, you know what? I'm going to try really hard not to screw this one up. I'm gonna try really hard not to screw this one up because I had hope now. I had a little bit of faith. I started to believe that maybe what everyone had been telling me for so long as I sat in those jail cells about this program and how it works and if you work steps and you build a relationship with God, that you could stay sober. And I decided that I was gonna give it a shot. And I started to do the things that they told me to do. And I went in there and I listened. I just listened. And I went to every single meeting that they took us to, and I went to every single meeting that was brought in, and I watched what was happening around me. And most importantly, I started to pray. I prayed in the morning, God, please keep me sober today. Please don't let the obsession to use take over me, because that is, it's like, it's like it, it it's like it envelops you. It's like you, like you're in a prison, like bars around you, like if you move, like you, you can't even get out, like it's like just you're, there's no space to even breathe. And I was like, please, God, don't let that come back. Please, God, at least alleviate it for just a few minutes today. And then at night, I would say, thank you for keeping me sober. And I started to do that. And at 60 days, I had my next spiritual experience. It was around 60 days. And I remember sitting out there at what was called the smoke pit, <laughs> um, where everyone would roll up their babies in their strollers and smoke their cigarettes. And at this time, I was a smoker, and no one was out there. Normally, there was that there was, place was never quiet, right? And I had just been, we did groups all day long from 8 to 5, because this wasn't like an insurance facility. This is a state-run facility. So we did groups 8 to 5. And um, then you went to meetings in the evening time, and you had to be like locked in your room and no phone and the whole thing. And so it's like 5 o'clock. We're getting ready to get on the bus to go to the meeting. No one's out there. And I'm sipping coffee and drinking my Newport, or smoking my Newport. And I'm looking around, and the sun's setting, and I'm just like taking it in. And I'm just feeling really still. And all of a sudden I realized that I haven't thought about using in a couple days. And I felt this sense of freedom. I felt this sense of like, oh my God, I can breathe. And I hadn't experienced that in years. I don't think I ever experienced that even before I started drinking or drugging, because drinking and drugging is not the problem. It's, the, my, it's my emotional unmanageability, it's my spiritual malady, it's that I am irritable, uncomfortable, and discontent. I don't know how to feel my feelings. Mm. And so as I started to learn to do that and that obsession got lifted, I started to be okay with just being. And that was a miracle. And I used that, I built off of that momentum, and I just kept, flowing through it and flowing through it and doing everything they told me to do because I was like, holy shit, something's working, right? And nothing I had ever done had ever worked, <laughs> okay? Not even for like a day or two. Like the people who can put together a couple weeks, I feel sorry for you guys because you can like lie to yourself and think that you have some control over this freaking thing. But like I knew, thank God for my pitiful, incomprehensible demoralization because I knew that there was no way that I could ever control this thing and that's step one. Um, and so I, I, you know, I, I did the stuff that they told me to do, and I went to every single group, and I started to hear things. And like, there's all these little slogans and things in the room that people say that they don't really make sense until they make sense for you. And I was walking into the clinical building one day, and there was a girl struggling to get her stroller in like every other person would. And then there was this girl, Amy, 
And Annie was really sarcastic, and she hadn't bought into the program. She had been to Susan B. a few times, and she had relapsed a bunch and all this stuff. And uh, she was making fun of something somebody said. And she said in a very sarcastic tone, nothing changes if nothing changes. And I went, oh, holy shit, nothing changes if nothing changes. Like, I have to change everything. And in that moment, God gifted me with the presence to hear that. And it went from here to here. And I heard, I have to change everything. And from that moment on, I made some decisions that weren't necessarily suggested to me from this program, but I knew were right for me. Like the music that I listened to. The music that I listened to would trigger the shit out of me. Like it would make me want to go party. It would make me want to go to the club. I hadn't been to the club in like five years. I was a dope fiend. I was on the streets. You know what I mean? But like I would hear it and I'd be like, I ain't no club. Like I got dance, I got party. And that wasn't even the case for me, but I would lie to myself and I would think that it was fun, right? And that's that my brain tricks me and it makes me think that it was fun. It's fun still. And so I was like, I can't listen to this crap anymore. I gotta change it. And so I started listening to some different music. I had to search around a little bit, find some things that worked for me. Um, you know, I didn't I I I got rid of everybody. There wasn't many people left that actually want to talk to me. But like the people that did, I got rid of everybody. When I would go in the group and there would be that thing inside of me that goes, you should say something right now. Instead of denying that, that authentic truth, that God voice inside of me, I used it. I spoke on it. Even when my voice, my voice shook, even when I cried, even when it was uncomfortable, I got vulnerable and I got honest with the women around me. And those women taught me how to love myself. Those therapists taught me how to love myself. The people in these rooms taught me how to love myself. Not only did they teach me how to love myself, they taught me how to be a member of society. They taught me how to be a woman. And I'll tell you what, when I was in there, you know, from taking those suggestions and working this and getting a sponsor and doing everything that I was supposed to do, I, I changed. Because what's promised to us is that we have a spiritual awakening, a psychic change, a revolutionary change in our thinking, a personality change. I was no longer the same person that walked in those doors on April 21st, 2011. I was somebody different. I was who God intended me to be. And I, you know, I started school when I was in there. I had my baby. Um, I had a C-section. I had to take narcotics for the first 24 hours because they forced you to. I fought them. But they were like, no, you're like going to like go into shock and freak out and maybe die if you don't. So you have to like take this for the first 24 hours. But I was surrounded by people who loved me and knew what was going on. And I was a phone call away. There were three other girls in treatment with me who were having their baby. We were two days apart. I'm the only one who's still sober. One of them died. Somebody killed her in Hollandale. And that's the reality of this disease. Um, you know, but I was able to have my baby without the use of narcotics. And I made a commitment to myself when I was in that program that I was going to go to every single group because I was a truant, guys. I dropped out of school. Like, I didn't finish shit. I didn't go follow through with anything. And when I went in there, I was like, I'm going to go to every single one of these groups, and I'm going to do this right. Because you got points and stuff, too, and you got to, like, get, like, little perks and be, like, a peer leader and all that. You guys already know. I was, like, all about the stars, the gold stars. So I was like, I'm going to go to all of them. So when I got my baby, when I had my baby and I went back to treatment, I was in there rocking my baby in all the groups. I was standing in the back of that church in Hollandale in that meetings that we, the meetings that we would go to while people stared at me and tried to make me feel crappy for having my baby in there, for crying. And I would sit back there and I would look at him in the face and be like, I need to be here. And it was uncomfortable, but I did it. And I took buses. <laughs> took the bus with that baby for the first two years and they would leave you at the grocery store in this treatment center they would leave you at the grocery store and if you didn't figure out how to get back you had an hour if you missed the bus and you didn't figure out how to get back you better figure it out you're going to prison and all of us were on probation <laughs> like they knew we were going to figure out how to get back so i took those suggestions and i have to share a couple things before this finishes and i i got a little bit caught up and i apologize but because I followed the suggestions that were given to me, I was given gifts that are promised in this book. I was given freedom. I was given a new way of life. And I've had beautiful women on this path before me and men who have shown me how to live that life and who have taught me what's inside of this book, who have taught me how to live a life that I get to have joy and freedom and connection to others and purpose. And my first sponsor, she, um, 
she was a beautiful, beautiful girl, but she started to go more towards religion than this program. And she put her back, she put, she put religion before the 12 steps, when it's something that needs to be worked together. And because of that, she lost sight of this disease and she relapsed. And that girl ended up having a baby that's now in the system. And then she had another baby that died because she breastfed while she was under the influence. And this was a girl who her disease hadn't progressed that far when I knew her. But like I said, it's chronic, fatal, and progressive. We have it forever, it gets worse over time, it'll kill us if we don't do something about it. And she didn't do anything about it. She thought she was, but she strayed away from what worked. And that scares the crap out of me. And I wanna make sure that that never happens to me because I know what the suffering was like. Each of you know what your suffering was like. It might look a little bit different than mine. You might not have got to the bottom that I got to, but the emotions are the same. Feeling trapped, feeling powerless, feeling hopeless, feeling alone, those are the feelings. It doesn't matter if you have cars in the garage or if you're living on the corner. Those are the feelings that we can't deal with, that there's a solution for, that we don't have to live that way. And I want to share something with you guys before we go. Um, at the end of Bill's story, in the last two paragraphs, um, he shares something with us about his experience in this program and what it gives us. And I think it's important today, Matt, now more than ever, because we need hope and we need faith. Because without hope and without faith, we don't feel like there's anything to live for. We don't feel like there's a next day to go on to. We don't feel motivated to go to the meeting. We don't feel motivated to work with a sponsee, right? And he says, he says, there is, however, a vast amount of fun about it all. I suppose some would be shocked at our seeming worldliness and levity, but just underneath there is a deadly earnestness. Faith has to work 24 hours a day in and through us or we perish. Most of us feel we need to look no further for utopia. We have it with us right here, right now. Each day, my friend's simple talk in our kitchen multiplies itself in a widening circle of peace on earth and goodwill to men. And that is the basis of this thing. That is what keeps us sober, is God, our relationship with God, and work with other alcoholics and addicts so that we can share it with so freely given to us. Um, thank you guys for letting me share. I really appreciate it. First of all, I just want to say E amazing with an E, you hear me? Can we give her one more? Yeah. yeah. That was completely amazing. Um, I'm going to make it quick. Um, one thing that, uh, you know, my sponsor said, and one thing I realized going through this process, that this is a spiritual program for spiritual people. You know, each one, every one of us that's in this, this room right here, that's on Zoom, that's on Facebook. I hope you paid attention because it was meant for each and every one of you. It wasn't a gender on it, it wasn't a color on it, it wasn't, you know, it was that. No matter how low, how far you're away from God, he will find you and he will come. But you have to be willing to, to go with him. I want to thank you, Katie, for coming through. Yes. Beyond amazing. Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and let um, J uh, Stevie come through. Come on. Fire. Fire. Hi everybody, Stevie B, recovering alcoholic. This is my home group. Hey, Stevie. That was fire, Katie. <laughs> that was fire. You know, usually I'd, I'm, I'm, whew, I am speechless. We were listening to that from Boca. And uh, on the whole way down, myself and Anthony and Paul, and um, what a story. Wow. I don't know if you realize how blessed we are to have heard that or to even have Katie in this specific community. Yeah. That's uh, when you, as you uh, stay here in Alcoholics Anonymous and, um, uh, you know, get to experience conventions and get to experience travel and different meetings around the country. That is a that is that talk that you just heard just now. That's a talk that you can hear in any podium, in any conference, in any convention uh, around the world. I mean, that was that great, that God inspired. Uh, it had everything. 
even the cursing, even the 27, uh, uh, even the 27 S curses, uh, you did in the beginning, you were great. You, you filtered yourself for the first half hour. And then, and, and then as soon as you got into the spirit, it was over. It was over. I'm like, wow, listen to her. She's filtering amazing, but then that was it. Um, it made it more real. It was, your story is exactly what keeps us coming back. Uh, what it was like, uh, how it was, and how it's like now. And I am truly honored that I get to work with you and I get to see you a couple times a week or three, four times a week. I get to be in your presence. It's really, truly amazing. Um, uh, you know, tonight we got to see a, a friend of ours uh, by the name of Kent Paul. And Kent Paul um, was always uh, this incredible motivational speaker. And one of the reasons he was so motivational is because his body was so impressive as being a professional bodybuilder. And um, and tonight he didn't have that anymore. And uh, he's battling, he's gonna win. He's battling uh, cancer. He got to watch you do how it works tonight. And um, so he's battling cancer and he's lost uh, probably 100 pounds. And tonight was the wisest I've ever heard him. See, I, I was always inspired uh, by Kent Paul's messages on how to change our lives through uh, physical, mental, and spiritual combination. But tonight, I was inspired because he taught me something that I knew, but I had forgotten. And it's what you just reminded me. It's that our only purpose here on planet Earth is to talk about what God has done in our lives. Amen. And our only purpose is to talk about God and to glorify Him. And it, I want to apologize if I've ever, um, well, I definitely have, not if ever, when I have glorified myself. Uh, I want to apologize because it's all about glorifying God. It's not about glorifying this book. This book is awesome. But this is not where it's at. This is the platform and the street and the highway on where we get to be in a place of permanent sobriety one day at a time so that we can talk about God. It's not about our personal stories, although your personal stories were so fantastic. And, and like yourself, I was a ballerina also. <laughs> I don't know why you're laughing. You started as a ballerina. I finished as a ballerina. I was on my twinkle toes looking for a little bit of Tina outside the nightclub. But our stories disclose in a general way what it used to be like, and it's not even about them. It's not even about how amazing her stories were, and it's not even about how amazing she puts it together, and it wasn't even about any of that. And if during any of my step series, I made it about this book, I want to apologize. It's not even just about staying sober. It's about how all of it comes together so we can glorify God. Amen. And you did, you, you, you did it so amazing tonight. You did it so perfect tonight. I feel like I'm on cloud nine. I got to hear a man who's battling cancer, who's in uh, the last stages uh, before he wins. Because right now, he's 100 pounds down. And he's about to triumph and triumph over uh, his cancer. So I got to be in his presence tonight as he reminded me on why we're doing this. And then I got the double header of from start to finish, getting to hear your entire message from ballerina to dumpster to courts to jails uh, to 7-Eleven to, to freedom. freedom, Susan B. Anthony, to when, to when Amy said, if nothing changes, nothing changes. You know, and I want to cry too. I want to cry with you right now. I want to cry with you right now because this is what God does in our lives. He takes completely battered and shattered souls. Because like Ken Paul, he's not a shattered soul. He's a whole soul now, but his body is battered. He's not even tan. <laughs> you know, he never went a day of it. He's been, he's been tan since he's seven. 
<laughs> and he was so wise tonight. And it's amazing. At 7 o'clock, Kent Paul told the story of your story that you would be speaking at at 8.30. Brothers and sisters, I don't know if you realize how blessed we are. If you're settling for the just stay sober train, well, have a nice time. Last, uh, when was it that you spoke here, Maddie? Last Sunday? Last Friday. Last Friday. We, one week ago tonight? Mm -hmm. Last Friday, we heard this amazing story of that gentleman there on a life on how he stayed sober even when his son passed away. We heard a man talk about staying sober even when his wife strayed and went off the path of their marriage. We heard a man talk about staying sober in financial devastation due to a divorce. Tonight, I heard a man that is battling stage four cancer that's lost 100 pounds in the last three months talk about the only thing that matters is God. And then I got to hear Katie say the same thing. If you don't realize that we're the blessed ones, because we, we did drugs and alcohol, we did drugs and alcohol and we get to be here. You understand, Nicole? Your membership to this program is your degenerate. <laughs> That's the fee, Andrew, that we pay. We are at the door. Maybe not Nicole. Maybe not Nicole, but other ones. At the door, we take a card. Come on in, degenerate. Welcome. Welcome. Let me see your card. No, you look a little... No, you're definitely degenerate. Come on in. Come on in. And then we sit in the meeting, and we just laugh, and we just relate, and we, we, we qualify... And some of us are, are have more mental illness than than others, but we all have uh, one of these things. We uh, we at times we are at full flight of reality. Isn't that right, Anthony? Yes, sir. Anthony, I gotta tell you something. You have outdone yourself. <laughs> you have outdone yourself in the last two weeks. I don't even know how you can build on this. I I, I mean, you may just have to retire right now. <laughs> from from Maddie to Katie, I mean, it's really been quite amazing. So. Uh, thank you so much, Anthony. God bless you. Oh, we got announcements. Announcements is this tomorrow morning in this room at 9 a.m. We get about 10 people in here at 9 a.m. That's uh, we go out of the 24-hour-a-day book. That's also going to be on. Uh, Andrew's going to be broadcasting us with uh, JC's Sober Soldiers with a Z tomorrow night. Maddie, I happen to. You, I, I would appreciate if we could do it together. Um, I'm speaking on a Zoom meeting. Um, and it's going to be, Andrew, will you come here tomorrow night? Will you broadcast it? So tomorrow night, I'm going to be speaking on a Zoom meeting uh, in, uh, in uh, Maranac, New York. Um, so if you want to be here, it's not going to be the same story that you always heard. Because I want to um, maybe talk about some other things as part of my story. Because you guys know the, the middle and you know the end, but you don't, most of you don't know the beginning. And so I'm going to do a little bit of a different topic tomorrow night. That's tomorrow night at 7 p.m. So tomorrow night our events are um, 9 a.m. here, 11 a.m. IOP, uh, 7 p.m. if you'd like to come to the Zoom meeting, and then um, or or don't come to the Zoom meeting and go to church at 6 p.m. tomorrow night. But you can always catch that later on in YouTube. I'm not telling you not to go to church, God forbid. And then Sunday morning we recommend you getting to church. Uh, the church that I go to, the church that a lot of us go to, is right out down the street, Lighthouse Community Church. And that's at 10 a.m. And then in this very room on Sunday night at 8 p.m., we have a fantastic speaker called in the Stepping Out group. And her name is Karina. Karina. And she's amazing. Karina DeLeo. She's doing a fantastic Karina D. Sorry. She's doing a fantastic job. And she's in step five, five this week, got it. Yep, step five this week. So we got an incredible weekend planned. If you're planning on going back to the slop this weekend, shame on you. Okay, and because I'm not going to see some of you guys before Mother's Day, I want to wish you happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. You're an amazing mom. I get to witness it on a daily basis. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day. And to the women online, happy Mother's Day. And to the women on the Zoom, happy Mother's Day. And... We're going to have a great weekend. Amen? Amen. I look forward to being with you. Let's thank Katie one more time.
And once again, can we please thank Andrew, who is now on, on six weeks straight, every single day. Andrew, right there. Six weeks straight. That's amazing. He's going to be the most sober person after the COVID that's ever been. <laughs> Um, a lot of people don't understand that, you know, this is actually uh, considered our medicine, these meats. So, you know, I was honored to hear what you just put out there. That was all spirit. And um, I'm glad to be in this program. So next we're going to um, give virtual tips, right? All right. Uh, anyone wants to uh, give up the bike and pick up a white? Come on. Come on. Any new people in here that would like to pick up a white chip? Anybody on uh, over there? Online? No. On Zoom? Anybody over there? No, you got Zoom. I got Zoom. Uh, okay, uh, how about 30 days? Anybody want to pick up a chip for 30 days? Oh, we got oh. Oh. Terry, Terry, Terry. We got 30 days with Terry, baby. And also, he's a first responder, so let's also thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. We do want to say thank you to everyone that is being a part of this COVID, even, you know, the public workers, grocery stores, everyone that's out there, and we're not. Amen. Thank you. Um, how about 60 days? Anybody want to pick up a 60-day chip? Congratulations. How about 90 days? Anybody ready for the 90 days? <laughs> Keep on coming back. It works any way. How about six months? Does anybody got six months? Congratulations if you have that. How about nine months? Keep coming back. It works with you. Work. This month, uh, Tammy Joe will be celebrating. Tammy Joe, nine years. Tammy Joe, nine, nine years. Nine years. You right? You celebrate three years for Danielle. Oh, yeah, baby. Um, my homie Mario will be celebrating this month. Wait, wait, hold on. I think you forgot a very important person celebrating this month. Oh, I forgot about myself. Yeah, I'll be celebrating oh, one year. Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Couldn't do it without you. Yeah. All right. Maybe just had nine years, by the way. Oh, uh, last month, that was nine years. Your story was amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm. No 13 step. Uh... Oh, yeah. Hey, Chris, keep up the good work. Hey, I am proud of you. You've been doing a lot of good work out here, man. Keep it up. Um, Miriam, come and hit him with the golden text statement. Okay, I'm Miriam, I'm an alcoholic. Miriam. This is the golden text on page 191 of the big book. Bill was at my house talking to my wife and me. We were eating lunch and I was listening and trying to find out why they had this release that they seemed to have. Bill looked across at my wife and said to her, Henrietta, the Lord has been so wonderful to me, curing me of this terrible disease that I just want to keep talking about it and telling people. I thought, I think I have... I think I have the answer. Bill was very, very grateful that he had been released from this terrible thing and he had given God the credit for having done it. And he's so grateful about it. He wants to tell other people about it. That sentence, the Lord has been so wonderful to me, curing me of this terrible disease that I just want to keep telling people about it, has been a sort of, has been a sort of a golden text for the AA program and for me. All right, all right. We got a special way of ending this thing. Social distance, everybody. I do want to thank God for, for keeping the COVID out of this community. I want to thank God for allowing, you know, Andrew and, you know, us to be able to broadcast to people out there. This has been a big part of my sobriety because it's been the hardest part of it because I can't go to the meetings. But there's no reason for me to not do do the work since I have the time. So um, 
We're gonna uh, give one uh, a moment of silence for the sick and suffering, the ones that feel like you're you're alone. You're not. Right. Our Father. Our Father. Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. See you next time, y'all.